So good evening, folks. I'm Rick Medeiros. If you don't know who I am as superintendent of school, getting my sixth year here in the district, I'd like to welcome everyone to our fourth meeting, second kind of town hall on site gathering of the reopening Free Lake Task Force. I'll start off before we show a brief uh, video, just with a quote um, from the former CDC director, Tom Frieden, this weekend. Quote went as follows, very appropriate, I think, for today. The bottom line is any community can open schools. The hard part is opening them and keeping them open. And only a community that both controls COVID and opens carefully is gonna be able to do both. So our task is hopefully to meet that, that goal and certainly that challenge. Um, some of you were referencing, we were talking about Major League Baseball in that same battle right now, trying to determine after starting whether they can continue that process. I'd like to thank everyone for participating. Obviously, once again, this important endeavor, which includes a community and staff survey, which I'm gonna give some results of in just a moment. Your role is really as kind of a communicator and an advisor as a task force member or some of you in attendance. And it's critical to, critical to community awareness so people feel comfortable as we lead up to the six, month, six weeks. Wish we had six months, it doesn't, certainly doesn't seem that way. We received the DESE plan template only July 15th for a deadline of next, this coming Friday, the 31st, for the initial preliminary plan, which I'm gonna to speak to tonight. Primary focus remains on all schools returning to some in-person instruction safely. Please know the district is, I can tell you, is working day and night to submit a plan for a safe return to school in the fall for as many students and staff as possible. The school-based teams have played an integral role, all five schools in performing the feasibility studies to make a determination whether we can do that in a safe environment, providing the necessary details for the district submission to the state. We'll need to shift a lot of the work in this next coming month from kind of district advisory communication groups to, to really the site-based building teams to do the real work for August as we have 43 days to that Tuesday after Labor Day, that six week time frame that we're targeting for ha to having our students back in some model to school. I still remain confident in spite of what the state, in state, with the state guidance and certainly local and state health numbers that we can make a safe and smooth transition back to school. All schools have submitted three required models for the district plan. I'm gonna speak a little bit <clears throat> to that tonight. It's a preliminary plan. Understand the school committee ultimately has to take the formal action and vote on the plan prior to the final August 10th plan being submitted. And then obviously we'll prepare over the coming weeks after that decision is made. And, and you know, for school board members, Sherry Barron is in attendance representing the school board. I'm not so sure there's, there's been a tougher decision uh, in the history, right, of schools to make a determination relative to that. And believe me, we're getting breaking news and guidance on a daily basis. As I literally walk down to set up for tonight, about 540, the commissioners email came to the superintendents informing us that they just made the final decision or formal decision to reduce the school year from 180 to 170. So there's been a lot of discussion and negotiation in relation to the unions and so forth, but we had not received any formal notice until about 540. And so I received an email today, not surprisingly, that in fact he's given school districts some discretion prior to the start of school to use up to 10 days in preparation for kids returning to school. With, and there's a couple caveats, such as you can't start school later than September 16th. You can decide how you wanna use those days, but it was certainly an attempt to provide some flexibility to some instructional hours. And literally that happened as I was just coming down prepared. It wasn't a shock, we were kind of informed of that, but it became formal from the state uh, this afternoon. We received guidance recently on transportation food service, facility operations, all documents I've shared with the task force. As soon as I get them, you probably get them within 24 hours. We're still waiting word on athletics um, and athletic activities. We're looking at some potential adjustments to the school calendar. I have a proposal tonight in relation to the task force and the school committee looking at, and that was prior to the 170 piece, but it reflects the fact that we were trying to build some time in to be as prepared as possible. Please know all stakeholders remain part of the process of a safe return. I'm gonna show you a brief video right now that came from, it's actually a doctor's video from the state in response to this. 
and then I'm going to go through a, a quick overview of PowerPoint uh, in relation to our plan specifically. Mr. Ward, I think, has it queued up and ready. I'm going to step aside just two minutes. Two and a half minutes. When we look at how things are going related to COVID-19 in the state of Massachusetts, we actually have a lot to be optimistic about. We've done a phenomenal job of getting our rates of transmission down. We are viewed around the country as a leader in developing strategies to reduce the spread of infection. Getting our kids back to school is really only safe because we've gotten the rates of transmission down to a low level, low and, and continuing to, to drop. If we were in another state, we'd be having a different conversation. There will be important measures that are going to be implemented at each individual school to make sure that kids stay safe, kids and teachers. One of them will be social distancing. We're going to keep kids apart. We're going to rely heavily on the use of masks, which we know are highly effective at reducing transmission. We're going to rely on hand hygiene. We're going to really in, and require children to be washing their hands or using hand sanitizer frequently over the course of the school day. So one of the most important things that parents and families can do to support safe return to school is ensuring that they're only sending their children to school when they're well. Every day we want parents to ensure that their children don't have any symptoms that could be a sign of COVID. We know that classrooms are gonna look different than they did last year. They're gonna be configured in a way that's gonna maximize the safety to both students and to teachers. The first difference that will be noticed is that the desks are gonna be spaced further apart. We know that not every classroom will be able to achieve six feet of distancing, and that's safe provided that children who are in those classes, as well as the teachers, are wearing their mask. In addition, they're all gonna be facing forward because we know that sideways transmission is rare. And with those strategies in place, distances shorter than six feet can still be done safely. So because of what we've learned about the virus itself, we feel comfortable that the plans that have been outlined are a safe and effective way for our children to return to school this fall. I'm an infectious disease physician, but I'm also a mom. And there is nothing more important to me than the safety of my kids. I really believe that we're putting together strategies that are gonna protect our kids and the educators in the classroom to make it safe for them to go back to school. My children are gonna be going back to school in the fall and I am really confident that they're gonna be fine. Thank you. Just a very brief video that from medical experts in relation to where we're at, not only in Freetown and Lakeville, but certainly in the state of Massachusetts in comparison to what's happening nationally. What I'm going to do right now is walk you through some additional new slides, some survey results, some updates in relation to our current plan, and then certainly we'll open it up to, um, to questions. And, and certainly answers as it relates to kind of where we're at. Mr. Ward, thank you for helping coordinate that. Again, primary focus remains on seeing all our students, or as many students as possible, return to school safely. In order to do that, I'm gonna have to kind of move, I'll stay right there. In order to do that, it's critical that we do all the things that were listed in the video, and then some. And I can assure you, behind the scenes, and I'll be happy to speak to them tonight. We are doing multiple things. Behind me, for example, are the cohorts for busing. Two groups relative to uh, the hybrid model in addition to our busing. Um, I had a lengthy transportation meeting in order to be sure that we meet the guidelines as it relates to transpo transporting students safely. In our buses, we can seat up to 24 students, a couple more students if they're siblings. But so we're taking those necessary steps. We can speak to PPE. We can speak to a variety of things that are happening that this district is well prepared and equipped to see our students and, and staff return, returning safely. This is from the dashboard from the state. So many of you have seen it. 
This is from last Thursday. And it simply identifies the age group. The average age is 51 for cases in the state of Massachusetts. And as you can see, the vast majority of cases don't involve students you know, ages zero through 19. And I, get, I recognize that there's much more to that. And you may not be able to see all the numbers behind it. This, this will be available. Can you not hear me, Ann? No, I can. I, was, yeah. I have a question. Sure. Can, I, can we come back to that? You want to get on this slide? Yeah. Sure. What's the average age of our teachers? To do that. Yeah. So again, I, I don't have the average age of our demographics. And I'm not, this slide is not intended to say there's no risk. So when I, um, when I share this with you, it's really to show kind of where we're at as a state. I mean, it is, it is staff and students that are both at risk and obviously the entire community. And I don't, not sure I'm, I'm placing a, a higher priority in one or the other. I don't, to answer your question, know what the average age is. Renee uh, Vidal and I um, had a lengthy meeting today. She's the president of the association, very cooperative and supportive. And we both talked about the need to be sure that whatever model we, we choose, it's safe for all the adults and the students. This is, these are the numbers for the town of Freetown and Lakeville. Top portion, 106 cases. This was as of last week, last Wednesday in Freetown. Percentage change, decreasing. Lakeville, 63 cases decreasing and then it gives you actually the positive test in the last 14 days again my attempt and i want to be perfectly clear is not to tell you that there's no risk and or the potential for cases but on the other hand and i was a science teacher a high school biology teacher i based my decisions on data and if you look at the data for Freetown and Lakeville, and you look at the data for our school communities, it is possible to put a model in place to see students and staff return safely at a minimal risk. I didn't say a zero risk, and I'm not about to say that. But you did hear from some medical experts in relation to their own children, and those are decisions that we're going to have to make in the coming weeks about where we're at and where we think we can, can be. Now, one of the things we did, and I won't, I know it's difficult, it'll be up on the website already, and I, and I sent it out in Superintendent's Corner, is we made sure that the stakeholders, we had over 1,300 responses from parents, and it was broken down by grade, asking the question, do you feel comfortable with your children returning to school in September? Again, there was no unanimous piece, which is pretty common, right? Many, so many people that I anecdotally speak to, speak to with kind of this 60, 40, this 45, 55 range. Some people feeling very comfortable, some feeling not so comfortable. This was a, a general question in relation to whether they were comfortable seeing their students return in September. And then this question, interestingly, looking at the three models for the state, asked, if you could choose, what would you prefer? 80, 79% of families in Freetown and Lakeville said they would like to see some sort of in-person model. The combination of a full return, even with three foot distancing, or a hybrid model with 50% of the students returned for one week and then the other group, the other cohort, 50%. You combine those two numbers, that's where I came away with that 79%. 79% of our parents would like to see some sort of in-person instruction in our two communities. And about 20%, almost 21%, felt at this point, they felt the most comfortable way they could see a model would be full remote. I referenced it in a, uh, a little bit later, the survey in relation to one staff question, but the association did you know, a lengthier survey, and I'm gonna have Renee Vidal, the president of the association, speak to the adults and kind of where they stand in relation to the three models that we're being required to submit. If schools reopen full of part-time, would you be able to transport your child? Huge issue, transportation, safely, right? We just got the guidelines. Basically, in our bus of 71 students, we can place 24 students, one per seat uh, across the seats. So we have a maximum of maybe 26 or 27 students, depending on siblings. And we've made a couple of adjustments relative to our schedules and staggered time. We're encouraging 
alternative methods of transportation. But as you can see here, it's about a third percentage will say they'll take the bus. Some are indicating that they'll transport and some are still unsure because I think obviously they're waiting to see what, what happens in the fall and that's completely understandable. We are taking some steps already here though in the district to encourage and or promote in the event that we are able to see our students return in person to allowing for, which has always been a pretty accepted practice here in all, at all districts, uh, in all levels I should say within the district for students to be transported to school. One example, we're waiving the parking fee for high school students this year. So there'll be no fee in relation to them being able to, being able to bring their car to school for the 2021 school year. Just as another indication encouraging and some scheduling issues that we're looking at both in the morning and afternoon as it relates to the number of students coming in at one time and staggering that schedule. But transportation can't be the driving force, no pun intended, but it certainly has to be a factor at how safely we can do that, especially where so many of our students are transported 35 to 40 minutes, 45 minutes in some instances because of the sheer size of Freetown and Lakeville and the bus routes. If we're instructed to start the year in a distance learning environment, what types of supports? It's very clear that parents are looking for, if you look at the two big items at 60%, learning new content, helping with new content, but also assisting with students with engagement. Again, what I would say to families and parents is that we learned so much in our remote learning, but we'll be in remote learning 2.0 in the fall. You will see a different dynamic in relation to whatever model we choose as it relates to one-to-one -one devices we're rolling out in six, grades six to 12, a device for every student, every family, six to 12. We're hoping to potentially do it four to 12. And then we're also working with the elementary schools, K to three, as to providing accessibility to devices, not only for those families that need it at home, but also within the classroom as well. If we're instructed to start the school year with distance learning, will you require a device? 75, almost 76% of the families said they would not need a device. Again, we're gonna address that anyways because we'll provide some continuity and consistency with the type of device we're sharing. This is a one, set, one staff and I reference this because I wanna be sure and I've made, I think I've said it at least three times, if not more. We sent out, I, uh, the administration sent out one sentence to our employees, uh, to our teachers specifically. And the question was raised, if the buildings reopen the fall, what best describes how you currently feel about returning? The vast majority of the employees indicated that they would be able to return in various degrees. And that's not stated misleading. You can just look at the numbers. They either indicate that they can return to work, but they would prefer to work remotely, percentage, can return to work and confident that all the precautions are in place and can return but are nervous about the safe return. What was on top of that, which is gonna be shared, which was shared with me today and will be shared with the task force and ultimately the community and school committee is the association then took it one step further and asked, I wanna say Renee, 10 or 11 questions to provide a little bit more detail relative to the comfort level of adults. It should come as no surprise, the vast majority of adults returning to school in person have some genuine concerns about their safety and health and the risks involved. And certainly, depending upon what category they fit into, whether it be they're taking care of someone else at home, it may not be their own health, but the health of others within and or instances such as childcare. We talked today at length, very transparently about the fact that we're not looking to put anybody back into the classrooms that's not safe. And that goes for students and staff. And that's the bottom line. We're presenting three models to the state and we have to indicate by this coming Friday what model we're leaning towards at this time. So we've had four meetings. We have one more scheduled for August 10th. And then much of the work is, which has already been happening with building teams will happen. This is just an example of what the hybrid model could potentially look like in relation, and I know it's a little challenging. On the left-hand side, you see our calendar. It's up on the website, 180 school days, traditional school. We now know that we are only required to, to attend 170. But the left-hand, uh, the right-hand side, color-coded wise, shows 
the hybrid model, the model that I'm leaning towards as superintendent right now proposing for the state by this Friday. The hybrid model is one week on, one week off. I wanna be sure I'm clear about this. There has been no final determination. The school committee will vote that ultimately what model moves forward. We have to submit three models to the state. All of our students returning instruction at one time. That's the in-person model. The hybrid model, a combination of students returning, some coming in on site, in-person instruction, some remotely. And then lastly, all students working remotely. In all these instances, we have to build in options for all of our kids, for those families that are not comfortable with the hybrid and are in full in person. I think it's impractical right now to suggest that all of our students can come back relative to the three foot safeguards and some of the transportation and logistics that we have relative to cars, traffic, some unanswered questions. And I think some things will kind of be played out in the next four to six weeks in relation to kind of where we're at. So I just wanna be clear, the di district has not made a determination as to what model, but part of the initial plan presentation this Friday, July 31st, that is submitted by me, and it's a preliminary plan, is to indicate at this time, which model are you leaning towards for your district? And at this time, this superintendent um, ultimately, hopefully supported by the community, is trying to bring back safely half of our students in a one week on, one week off cohort. And that's what the hybrid model is. Uh, we can go through some of the details behind it. It can be some of the most disruptive type of model for those, those families in working, and I recognize that. But I have to balance that. We need to balance that as a school community as to what is the safest approach in relation to the number of students that we have, which is almost 2,900, the number of employees that we have, over 400, almost 450 now, and balance that with trying to get our students to come back. As I referenced and started this meeting off, the easy part's not opening school, it's maintaining it and keeping it open safely. Right, almost anybody can open the school, but if you're shutting it back down, what have you really accomplished in addition to what risks have you placed people in? And I can tell you 31 years in education, I thought snow day decisions were tough. This pale comparison, I never thought I'd say that up at three in the morning looking at that. Oh, by the way, we kind of take care of snow days, right? I don't even have to worry about that. We now have a process in place to address students staying home safely and, and being educated. But the hybrid model, and I know it's a little challenging for you to see in your seat, and we'll be able to share this on the website, um, and, I'll, and I'll share it out there. Basically has students, half of the students through the alphabet, A through K, as one cohort. And they will attend school for one week. The next week they will be home learning remotely. The second group would then come to school and attend. And those cohorts would alternate. In this instance, what I've actually built in is the, first, the last week in August, first week in September, as five professional days of training to allow employees enough time. And that would require a change in our current calendar. And we would start after Labor Day. And the first week we actually would have one cohort go two days and the next cohort. We then would start the, de the following week and do four days on, four days off, and allow our staff an additional day, but also our maintenance and custodial staff additional time to do some cleaning. So those first two weeks would be four day weeks, and then we'd roll it out. And I only rolled it as far as October. I don't think it's it, it really a, a, even a valuable responsibility and tasks to build in and project what it would be. Ultimately, the goal is, right, if we start out in a hybrid model, to see all of our students return safely to, to in-person instruction. At the same token, depending on what the data and what drives where we're at, we may also have to revert to full remote. Again, no determination has been made, and I can go through some of the specifics behind it. The building teams have done that. I just wanted to give you a little idea what's happening behind the scenes in relation to kind of getting prepared. We conducted a feasibility study, unlike a lot of school districts. By the way, my, my colleagues, there are about 87% of school superintendents have indicated they are leaning towards a hybrid model to start their school year right now. I could change next week. If you had taken that survey three weeks ago, it would have been a different number. Right? I think there are more superintendents prepared to see a full 
in-person instruction. And that appears to be moving towards as we get more and more guidance and direction as it relates to benchmarks. But the schools have determined we have space. We have space in our schools to accommodate them. I was talking, I'm gonna put Mr. Ward on the spot, but he represents the leadership team. About half of his classrooms are already set up with the spacing in place. And I showed you some photos of this is the planning piece. I'm just kind of skip through this a little bit. You've seen the teams. I'll, I'll show you the images in just a moment, but this is obviously the three models in existence just for some people. And I do see some new faces, right? We have three models. We have full in-person instruction, green. We have a hybrid model. That's the cohort A and B. And we have full remote students learning from home. We are looking to adjust starting times, both for educational purposes and also safety and health reasons, right? We got to stagger the concept that you bring all your students in at one time and then bring them through together is really something that's a greater risk. And so we have to take a look at what our dismissal time is at the end of the day, when our entrance is and take a look. And we're also looking to at the same time, look at the educational value, for example, of pushing back the start time of the high school and busing our students a little differently and starting about a half hour later. All of this and had a conversation with the president of the association needs to be negotiated ultimately with the bargaining groups to be sure that the adults are prepared and comfortable with that format this year. But we both agreed, and certainly I can have Renee speak to that, that at this time, until you really know what the model is and kind of what the direction is, it's a little premature, but, I, but we've been real transparent about sharing what these different options look like. A couple other references, I referenced signage uh, technology. We're looking at one-to-one -one devices, hopefully four to 12, six to 12 for sure. Capital projects are ongoing in relation to getting those medical waiting rooms in place near in close proximity to our nursing stations. We did have quite a few through the survey, through the help of some task force members, uh, quite a few additional community members step up and say that they would be interested in providing some support, um, both with medical expertise, but also just expertise in general to help track and help the schools be in a better place from a staffing perspective. In addition to the fact that we're posting positions for additional custodial and maintenance staff to address those needs. I referenced transportation, the food service director, Andrea. I don't know if Andrea is here, I see she is. She's in the process of just getting, she just received the guidance that you received relative to that. She's setting up meetings with each of the principals and the building teams to discuss how we can safely have our students receive lunches, whether it be the using the cafeteria, classrooms, a combination of the, all of the above. Some schools are looking at using outdoors and corridors. I think between the classrooms and the cafeterias at our schools, we should be able to accommodate our students and provide uh, appropriate lunches, not all schools. Many schools are having to use them for academic space. We have the luxury, when I say luxury, of having facilities at all five schools that won't force us to do that and allow us a little bit more safe space relative to food service. I know everybody's you know, waiting to hear about athletics. There was, a, there was a guidance I shared with you in relation to extracurricular activities beyond chorus and band and the restrictions for physical education. The MIA has made a determination that, that fall sports will not start any sooner than September 14th. Um, there has not been a final determination made as it relates to fall sports, um, but that should be coming literally in the next week or two. Again, the models, just in more detail, the full instruction has three feet of space in between desks. The hybrid model has six feet of spacing, has half of our students in two cohorts, A to K, L to Z. We'll make some exceptions to family members that have different last names so we don't split up families as it relates to that. And one week on, one week off, and then obviously full remote. I've referenced some of the transportation items that have come up. The 24 students per bus, these are, these are state guidelines. Masks required, windows should be open with the exception of instances where the, the weather just doesn't allow for it. There should be assigned seats. Had a lengthy transportation conversation with Mr. Resendiz. Mr. Resendiz is in attendance as well. Just real supportive, great working relationship, but all the complexity and the bus routes, some of you shared already providing the cohorts A and B and what their bus routes are and lists. I mean, transportation departments already not only assign students to buses for full instruction a month in advance even can reference the fact that we're probably ahead of a lot of districts but also already divided up the cohorts and began that process of looking at what 
how can we safely transport our students? Again, we're doing it for all students, knowing that there will be many families and parents and, and students that will be transported through different modes, right? Will be transported because they choose to and maybe do it now, but maybe start to do it until they feel they can safely do that. So we're encouraged to some of those options. I referenced parking, staggered starts. We're identifying the cohorts. The calendar needs to be updated. Food service, once again, there, and technology. It is real challenging. Here are a couple of the images. Just take a, I know I, know I shared this last time, but this is Aswamsted Elementary School, three feet of spacing. This is what, just so, and Mike can speak to this if you'd like. So this is the way we're setting up our classrooms, regardless of the model. So if we bring all our students back, this will accommodate a classroom with three feet of spacing. That would be the full green in-person instruction. A hybrid model would be every other row, right? And then the following week, you use the other desks. So we're not gonna remove the desks, but that gives you a little perspective as to how much space is in between in the hybrid model for the students. We're not physically removing the desks, right? We're gonna have them left there, and that will help with traffic flow and pattern. But that's at a swamp sit. Mike, please correct me, but jump in. At Freetown Elementary School, you said part of your classrooms are already set up. And they are set up, correct me if I'm wrong, Mike, like that, but with the idea being that that would be the spacing in the hybrid model where half of our students return. And then there were some other photos. Again, I, I noticed Dr. Sullivan's here from the intermediate school. These are the classroom desks, three feet of spacing depending upon the model that's ultimately adopted and voted on by the school committee, we can place 10, 11 students in there, or 20 or 21 students, you know, the typical average class size, you know, a couple students give or take either way. We are certainly looking at decisions that some families will make relative to not wanting their students to start school and providing some sort of remote platform that will allow those families to either homeschool their children and or to provide a district slash state platform that will allow that to happen. We recognize the challenges, certainly with the younger children, not that we don't have challenges with middle school and high school students, but clearly the, the, the self-directed um, students as they get older and be able to handle that, we recognize the, the complexity relative to K to three, Mike's a K to three principal, pre-K to three for that matter. And the challenges faced with those students being able to handle that. There's just a couple more of the slides. Middle school, three feet. That's what you're gonna see in a middle school classroom. And then you just make the determination how many students are gonna be sitting in there. And there's the six feet spacing. Pretty significant difference. High school, high school, six feet. So I don't, and I appreciate the fact that it's kind of turned into a lecture type of thing. It wasn't intended, it was more from an informational perspective. I want to open it up to task force members. So just to you know, kind of give the, the frame of reference, on a daily basis, we're getting guidance and parameters and direction from the state relative to the topics. And yet, we don't have endless amount of time. I think I said it last time, we had 50 some days and now we're at 43 days. Depending upon when you start, we can make adjustments to that calendar. Keep in mind the commissioners made it the determination 170 days you can't start school later than September 16th. I'm not so sure Renee and I had a conversation today. Do we want to block all 10 of those days at the start or do we want to spread them out and establish that depending on what model we, we, we take moving forward. Ultimately the governor and the commissioner and the state has not made any determination that there will be a unified decision being made that could change. But there's no indication right now based on information that I have, I have a conference call with the commissioner on Wednesday afternoon that would give anything but local authority to school committees and administration and task force and teams to make a decision that is best for the students and the children and the families and the adults in Freetown and Lakeville. I tried to give you a little perspective because as some of the doctors started off this night as saying, if you're in different parts of the country right now, you can't even engage in this conversation about how are we gonna safely see our students return to school based on their numbers. 
But I think based on the numbers that we see in front of us today, in our communities, we certainly can engage in a conversation. You notice I didn't say that you are forced or need to sign up to a decide decision. I recognize the anxious level. I am first and foremost a parent, parent of two children, myself, college age, tell by the age probably that that's the case. But I always say, listen, I have 2,800 students, 2,900 students. Every decision I make is made in the best interest of my staff and students. And so if I think, or you know, we feel that we're putting someone at risk, we're not gonna reduce the risk completely in relation to what's happening for the fall. But there are many factors where relative to our kids not returning to school that need to be considered as we move forward in a timely fashion to make the determination. Again, preliminary plan being submitted that we are looking at right now or leaning towards a hybrid model to see, to maximize the number of students we feel we can comfortably see safely return and staff to school. There's a lot of mitigating issues and factors as it relates to number of employees that might not be prepared to come return to school that may be in an at-risk group. There are transportation questions. Mr. Resendiz is here. We had a lengthy, lengthy questions. So just, I'll give you an example of kind of the conversations that, that we're having detailed and researched. So the busing guidance seems pretty straightforward. You assign students, you can seat them one per bench and they need to sit. So as you're picking them up, they should go to the back of the bus because you don't want the travel. It seems to make logical sense. So you have them going to the back. But if the first student you're picking up and it's an elementary run is a kindergarten student, and you now have a kindergarten student in the last row of the bus. Those are the tough type of decisions and balancing that we are looking at. We didn't come up with it, but I'd love to tell you that we had the perfect scenario. Um, but those are the type of challenging decisions that we face and we need to do what's best for our kids and our staff. But that's just an example in transportation, likewise in food service. We're looking at trying to have employees and staff move and not students move as we keep them in cohorts. Of course, when you have cohorts, you keep those 10 students together for the day, you really limit their exposure to other groups and then you put them back on the same transportation bus with other cohorts. I, I mean, so I mean, that it's just the, the truth, the nature of, of how you're gonna transport other than those students um, being transported in other means. So I am not, first of all, I'm comfortably sharing with you tonight that I am confident that the plans and the initial models that we're submitting to the state have been vetted, have been incorporated or continue to incorporate the five school teams that are working diligently as to how we can do this at their specific school and level. And then ultimately, in a time frame that the school committee, um, I don't envy in relation to the decision. Um, we were told we need to have that final decision prior to the August 10th deadline to the state, which, would, which actually requires the school committee meeting on August 5th, not this Wednesday, next Wednesday, to vote on an initial model to move forward. And then sitting down and bargaining and with your collective groups and being sure that the work environment is conducive to that and probably having about four weeks to roll this out. So we have a lot of work ahead of us. I can tell you, I am confident in the leadership team and the staff and the support. I have not come across any staff or employee or any adult that doesn't wanna see the kids return to school. Renee and I had the conversation today. I'm not putting on a spot association, right? I don't, I don't. And even parents and community members and staff members that said they were real apprehensive and are prepared to come back. I understand that, They're, but they wanna see kids return to school safely. They wanna greet students. Renee, I'm, I'm picking on poor Renee as president, but sixth grade teacher is saying, says to me, I'm gonna see my fifth graders coming to me, but may not in a remote setting. And how challenging that is to come to a new school and not see the students face to face. Those are the tough challenges ahead of us. I'm glad to see so many of you in, in attendance tonight. I know I saw a couple of hands, so I'll open it up, which I anticipated. It's a little past seven o'clock. I tried to keep the vast majority of it so you could engage in conversations. I know Lake Cam does have a request that you go to the microphones. 
Jose's giving me a thumbs up back there because I did remember the microphone over here. I know some of you are not necessarily wanting to do that, but it's real helpful because I can tell you that quite a few emails came to me last night and tonight about this being streamed live, which it is because people weren't able to make the meeting, but wanted to hear. So I would appreciate if you don't mind just introducing yourself, keeping your social distance, and then just, you know, we can, we can open this up. I'm not planning to get into subgroups, the subcommittees per se, because I'd like everybody to hear it, because there were some real engaged conversations at the different groups. And if there's some things you want me to bring back to the building teams, I can do so. Derek, before you go, I, did, I referenced her a couple of times and I apologize, Renee, just as president of the association, maybe the detail behind the survey and just a couple of comments on some things that maybe I didn't capture, if you don't mind. Renee is the newly elected, boy, talk about timing. President of the association, right? Um, welcome, Renee. Thanks. Thank she, she initiated a conversation. We've had multiple conversations, and we met for about an hour, a little more than an hour today, just talking about some of the same things I'm sharing with you in full transparency in relation to what we can do to, to safely see our staff and students return to school. Renee? Thank you. Uh, so once again, Renee Vitale representing uh, EAFL. Um, so we did survey our members. Um, I do plan on um, sharing that. I did share that with Rick today. Um, and I look forward to sharing it with the rest of the task force as well as our membership and school committee as well. Um, out of our 272 members, 259 members participated in the survey, which is a 95% return. So that was uh, pleasing. Um, no surprises, it, it really did model um, the one question put forth by the district. Um, 68 um, members uh, felt safe to return. Uh, 14, um, if childcare was not an issue, would agree with that. So that's about 31.7%. Um, 150 members are nervous. They are uncomfortable. They want to ensure the safety of not just themselves, but the, the kids in, in the classroom as well. And uh, 26 members mentioned that uh, they would not be able to return if we were back um, all in at this point. Um, then um, another takeaway was just some of the concerns that are coming up um, with um, facilities. I know that um, Greg has done a wonderful job with ordering the PPE um, for faculty and staff, as well as any students that um, weren't provided or don't have access to um, adequate PPE. Um, so that was certainly something that was a, a concern uh, for us as well. Um, if uh, we were to make a decision and this uh, survey went out last week, due back last Thursday and we processed the results over the weekend, um, 141 members would rather teach remotely as the safest option and 118 um, members wanted to return to school. Um, so there's no easy answer. We're very well aware of that. There's no best case scenario for 2020 um, and 2021. Um, that is a, a fallacy. Um, you know, we would all love to go back to pre-COVID or post-COVID once there's a vaccination. Um, so what is best for students and staff um, and um, what's the safest? May be different answers, may be the same. So. Um, we look forward to working uh, with the district and with the community members. You guys have done a wonderful job um, doing what we're all supposed to do, maintaining six feet distance, minimizing exposure, wearing masks. Um, I see it as I um, encounter the community members um, and it's, it's proof with the statistics about the minimal exposure and it's a great thing that we can have this discussion and that we're not in some of the states that are heavily impacted at this point. So th thanks, Renee. And again, I just wanted to share from a transparency. She's going to share with me the editor and rights probably already has done that. I'll make sure the task force receives so you can see all the results in detail 
uh, relative to the questions and the, and the percentages that she shared. I'll be forwarding that to the school committee. Those of you that know me, if I get home in a reasonable time, I'll do that tonight or first thing in the morning. And we've done that across the board, folks. You're getting the guidance. So if I'm receiving state guidance, and we'll put it up on the website, you're receiving the exact same detail and the, the exact same information. Now, again, in fairness, we aren't sharing with you every little bit, bit of detail relative to facilities and air quality and the fact that, that what we're doing with each unit event you, and train coming in with some capital projects. But be assured, because that is an issue in relation to buildings, that we have taken a real proactive approach prior to this. And, and it's fortunate that we have, for example, three huge capital projects going on at all the campus schools here in relation to uh, addressing air quality specific. Ironically, it was a decision that we made prior to COVID. And so couldn't have, certainly couldn't have come at a better time in relation to making sure that we put us, ourselves, our students and our staff in a position to be safe. Derek, you wanna jump up? Absolutely. Uh, well, just first an observation on that. It sounds like um, the hybrid model could be in jeopardy depending on which way some of your staff leans. Um, question for you, can you give the, um, the audience an example of what the delivery of a hybrid model would look like? Because the details are, are hazy here. Yep. One week off, one week sounds good, but operationally, I've said this from the beginning, I don't understand how this is yep. feasible. So, so I'd like to hear yep. both from a teacher's perspective and from a parent student's perspective sure. of what that's gonna look like. Yeah, so, it's, so uh, let me make sure I'm clear. It's not one week on, one week off. So if I, so I apologize if I, in fact I gave the impression or gave that, use that terminology. It's one week of insight, right, in-person instruction and then one week of remote learning instruction. And, it, and it, you need to do that simultaneously. Um, and the building teams are sitting down with their teaching teams right now. I'll give you the general overview. Renee asked the same question you did, Derek, which is that's the real struggle. Right, it's not the 10 students you have in front of you that you're providing instruction for, right? In some instances, educators would say, would welcome that. Class size of 10 would be ideal, right? Private schools in relation to kind of being able to do that. It's what engagement we, do we have with those 10 students that are not in front of the teacher? And to Derek's question, how do we be sure that we deliver and we're not simply giving them a week off and then the next week having to reteach that and then those other kids have a week off. So there's a variety of mechanisms that we have in place to kind of do that, whether it be some of the Zoom conferencing and or um, student-centered, teacher-centered approaches. It's not, uh, it's, it's not me skating the, the, the answer either because it does vary and changes from elementary school to middle school to high school. But it is something that I can tell Mike is, is nodding, is, is that each of the principals and the teacher teams uh, looking at to be sure. They have actually submitted their initial drafts for hybrid models. And so when I reference some of those examples of a type of instruction they're gonna see, you are, the expectation will be those students that are home will be engaged. The question is what will that engagement look like and what will the minimum standards be to be sure that in fact it's productive. And so when they do come back, keep in mind, you can't really compare what we did in March through June. We simply shut down quickly we're somewhat prepared for remote learning, but we never had any insight on-site instruction. And then there's that other factor which came up at school committee. What about kids who choose not to or families that don't come back at all? Mike, do you wanna speak? I don't wanna put you on the spot, but specifically to your level, the engagement piece. Just again, he's not speaking for every principal. We do have Dr. Sullivan, I'm not putting her on the spot, but, but I think you hit the crux of the real question as it relates to hybrid, right? Not what the instruction looks like for those teachers, for the students that are seeing the teacher, but those kids that are home. Yep, again, um, Michael Ward, Prince Ward Freetown Elementary School. Um, just as far as speaking to just the FES staff and the work that we're talking about from a teacher's point of view, if it's a week on, so if it's a week and those students are in, so you can imagine it's face-to-face -face learning like the teaching, right? Just the typical day that's there. But you remember from the elementary point of view, you've got your other half at home, right? So you think about the piece that, okay, they're in for uh, week A, right? So that week comes to an end, you think of a Friday, okay, here's the work that you're gonna be working on. Remember this skill. Uh, Mr. Ward's gonna leave this assignment for you. It's gonna be remote learning. Here's how you're gonna have to log in. Uh, those pieces will all be discussed with our students and how to get accessibility. Uh, 
I apologize. Yep, I'll take a step back. Does that work? All right, sorry about that, everyone. And as far as uh, what we need to do uh, for parent point of view and student point of view is obviously we have to think about how we can teach families how to uh, connect uh, with the Google Classroom type of piece. So we may have to have some teaching moments or pre-recorded videos so we can get that information out there for families. So the Friday comes, we may share, or we will share, hey, this is what it's gonna look like, your home next week. Here's the to-do list that you gotta work on and put that out there for the families to know. We are talking with further conversations, nothing definitive just yet. We're trying to look at what we call social meets, right? Um, an example of this would be, so on a regular day, you have a, a morning meeting in the classroom, right? So those students are home. We want to make sure they're interacting with their peers still, right? So teacher may log in. And this, again, there's nothing definitive on this, but this is a possibility that a teacher can log in, have a conversation uh, for a morning circle, and the students at home can hear that conversation. Same thing for such as a read aloud. You can hear the conversation and interaction and the questions that are happening. It's not so much where a teacher is going to have to teach this and we're going to ask a five-year-old to sit on the computer at home and have to do that work. We've sort of got to wrestle with that and sort of come up with a way to make it work for both sides. So those are examples of how we're trying to make it work and then a to-do list so that way they can get those assignments in on a Friday. So, okay. so Mike, thanks. First of all, he spoke specific to his school each school team and i highlighted that has educators and their administration and they're working on that task it is clearly something that has to be prioritized and identified for the hybrid model renee and i had the conversation and making sure educators were on board in relation to that derek so it is a work in progress if the, that is the model that's ultimately adopted it's going to be extensive work and continue to be extensive work leading up to those weeks in addition to some additional training and professional development for for individuals because keep in mind our experience with remote was full-blown remote right we had all the students home and we learned from that now we have that blend again th the mindset keep in mind going back to our original goal is to see students return to in-person instruction so it is a blended piece, and it, certainly there are some pros and cons to each of the models, and I'm not about to dismiss that that's not the case. For those people that are working, I'm just giving you a candid one. I'm telling you the model that I think I'm leaning towards, but I recognize that it might be the most disruptive to the working families, because I don't think they have employees that have that same schedule and breakdown. I, you just, you just, is it just recognize and introduce yourself, go ahead. I'm Ken Wisniewski. I have four kids in the school system. Mr. Medeiros, thanks for having this open forum. Appreciate all the work that you and other folks on these teams and committees have done. Uh, just like you, I like to look at the facts and the data and what's best for the kids and safest. And I think if you really analyze all that, there is a pretty obvious way here, at least in my opinion. COVID's been here for over six months now. It's fairly well understood at this point. According to the CDC website, uh, 21 children between the ages of 1 and 14 have passed away from COVID, which is, and that's across the nation, very, very unfortunate. It's a little bit more, closer to 30 when you go up to 18 and under. It's believed a lot of those children had other serious illnesses. But I won't kill you with numbers to put this in perspective. Vehicle accidents kill 6,300 kids annually, poisoning 4,200, drowning 4,000, and of course the flu kills hundreds of children each year. So I just have to take a second look when we talk about revamping our entire educational system here and what our children are being protected from and why, because I'm not seeing the data to support it. I know it's more severe in the adults. I'll, I'll get to that real quick, but uh, I'd say don't take it from me. The American Academy of Pediatrics, probably your children's doctors out there, believe that children should return to full-time and I quote, the importance of in-person learning is well documented, and there's already evidence of the negative impacts on children because of school closures in the spring of 2020. Another quote, academic, physical, and mental upsides associated with returning children to school full-time outweighs the risks. It's according to the American Academy of Pediatrics. What's the World Health Organization think? Their chief scientist agrees that children are less capable of spreading the virus and are very, very low risk of getting ill from the disease. 
Boston Globe reported people under the age of 20 have gotten COVID-19 account for less than 0.4% of the people in mass. COVID-19 is largely sparing the state's youngest. Our friends in Canada had one death out of 7,088 uh, cases in children and teenagers. That means 0.013% people have passed away that are children. That's a decimal for uh, science teachers of 0.00013. So just to summarize, through no fault of our great teachers in Lakeville and Freetown, I think they're some of the best. We know that virtual education is subpar, may have lasting negative impacts on our children that could manifest in social ways or social issues, lower SATs, and perhaps ultimately where your child may attend college. Getting to the bottom here, we also know that the effect on lower income kids is even greater. Students with IEPs, five, uh, 504s and other learning accommodations are going to put, be put at even a greater disadvantage based on a hybrid model. So I think we should follow suit with what the American Academy of Pediatrics is saying, go back to school. And I, I think it's a very tough decision for Mr. Medeiros and for the committee. But I think if you just look at the numbers, you look at who this affects, I think it's a very courageous decision to say, let's go back to school full time based on the data. And the minute we start, we start seeing COVID-19, if we see it wreaking havoc, we pull back and go virtual or hybrid. But I, I think it's a very responsible thing and the right thing for our kids to do it that way. And there's really no data behind a hybrid. We've never done it before. The difference between three and six kids, is that gonna result in passed away kids in Lakeville and Freetown by December? You know, I'd argue probably not, um, but I know it's a tough decision. I, I could be go on, but I'll, I'll just finish by saying no matter how you slice it, and I've analyzed this with four kids in the school system, my biggest job is a parent to protect them. I think the right thing for my kids and for yours, again, in my opinion, is to return full time. So I, I thank you for your attention and I, um, okay. thank you. I know a couple of them in line. I think there were two here, then we'll after that. Yes, go right ahead. Right. Morgan Long, I'm a father of an incoming Falcon. You know me now because we corresponded by email. And I'm gonna focus my comments about the distance learning. I'm not, I'm not gonna get involved in numbers because as a medical practitioner, I know the numbers will change. We can't affect that. It seems to me like we need to plan for a worst case situation, in quotes, which would be total distance learning. That said, and as I pointed out to you in, in an email a while ago, my biggest concern, my greatest fear is the experience we had this spring, which was totally abysmal. And I just wondered if you could elaborate a bit more on how that distance learning is going to move forward. Were you able to reach out to any of the purpose made distance learning schools like Connections Academy for ideas and resources? I know my experience from the kitchen counter or the office desk, depending on the day, uh, device non-compatibility we found through her teachers as well, one of whom is married to an engineer. Um, the, the Google Classroom system is not supporting iOS devices. Um, we had a tremendous problem with even being able to complete homework assignments physically, not, not the motivation to do so, but physically complete them and get them submitted due to platform incompatibilities. And then there's the issue that seemed to be missing of live lessons. We're talking about taking these kids out of the classroom, the enrichment of the classroom, but that's not necessarily true. And these other institutions have proven that. Uh, the teacher's there giving a lecture, you have to attend, attendance is taken, it's recorded digitally. And you have to participate, questions go out, they look for students to be answering. There's a little bit more of a drive there to involve yourself. It's not, as I heard mentioned before, a to-do list that's handed out which by the way, if we have to go to distance learning, again, borrowing from the model uh, uh, before us, um, if that's gonna happen, I would recommend that a syllabus be published at the start of the semester so that students, especially the upper school students and parents or learning coaches, if you wanna call them that, can see what's ahead, even if it's not yet coming up due. Uh, so those would be my questions right there. Mr. Long, what I, uh, thank you, and, and you did share that, I appreciate it. So without, I know there are other people that will have comments. Uh, my first response is the state, and I shared it with you, just recently released the new expectations and guidance relative to remote learning. 
it certainly has raised the bar statewide, but also locally relative to assessment, what the instruction will look like. And that's when I referenced earlier that it's gonna be a 2.0, it's not gonna be a repetitive piece of what you saw in the spring. Mm -hmm. We certainly have learned a lot. We do need to provide some additional professional development. We've looked at compatibility as it relates to purchasing devices, which we're doing within this district. And so I do think it is going to be a work in progress. I'm not saying it replaces in person, but I believe you will see a much better structure moving forward based on what the state is requiring. And I've shared that document with you, but also what we've learned as an experience. It is going to be and already has been um, a major priority relative to professional development for staffing as it relates, right? We couldn't anticipate that it was gonna happen so abruptly and quickly. We certainly have had multiple months now to prepare and we'll be in a better position. Again, it's not intended, my answer is not intended to say that and as a result, you should support remote learning. But as was stated, we need to be prepared for that model. Uh, and I think we're in a much better place than we, have, we were in the spring. I know there are a couple of the hands here that way to thank you. I apologize for pointing, <laughs> yeah, connect to me. Thank you. Um, Lisa Caranos, my daughter is at the high school here. So my question, um, I think a lot of um, folks have actually touched on it since I've um, come to ask the question. So it's not so much about the model, because I think once we figure out the model, then we'll figure out the other details come later on. So as a high schooler, who's, uh, my daughter is pretty self-motivated. Um, for me, it's more seeing um, not the model of learning, but the quality of learning or how she's learning. So she, I don't wanna see her sitting at the counter anymore saying, yep, I've got three minutes and then moving on. So, you know, my expectation almost is that if she has a 50 minute learning block, that she's going to be engaged for that 50 minute learning block, whether it's a remote experience through video, if it's a hybrid model, but her day at home is going to look like her day at school. And I understand that maybe for elementary school, it doesn't work that way. I don't have an elementary student anymore at this point. Um, I just have one left in the high school. But um, I don't know if that's been, it's been a little bit, you touched upon it a little bit as far as the distance. So whether it's a hybrid model, whether it's an in-school model or an at-home model, you know, if she's at home, I would like to see her for 50 minutes. If her passing period is a seven minute passing period, she has seven minutes. And then after that seven minutes is over, she's engaged with the teacher and the teacher's saying, hey, are you there, Sophia? Are you? So, so, so what I what I could say in response, similar answer. So what you're seeing is the state, first of all, the state is now saying that's instructional time, right? They did not say that in the springtime. They're saying basically we count this as a school day, but the expectations are here in relation to what that instructional time looks like. And, and Mike's reference was to keep in mind K to three. So you have to kind of blend that with a high school and middle school piece. I'm confident based on the hybrid and remote where you have aspects of that, but we're also gonna give the devices out even in in-person that you will see, you will see exactly the engagement that is necessary moving forward. I see some of the detail behind it. And as you said, once the model kind of plays out, you, your parents will be informed of that, but it's, it, but it's absolutely gonna to have to be our priority to be sure that in fact, we, we engage those students. I wouldn't say that they will mirror the passing time per se, but I get the, I, the concept, which is to be, have it in a structured way that would mirror those times. I can tell you the state's not gonna simply allow us as a pass and say, guess what, we're gonna count it as a school day and you're working an hour and a half and you know there's a five minute conference piece. That's, I can tell you the, the guidelines, if you had a chance to look at them yet, specifically state out there what, what the expectations are at each of the levels. And as a result, you will see, and I know it's hard for us all to do, I did it myself, right? You're, you're looking at your, your only means of comparison is kind of what you experienced in the springtime. I don't think that's gonna be the case moving forward. I, let me take that back. I know it's not gonna be the case moving forward because of the expectations and the standards, not only locally, but statewide. And it's something we're putting a concerted effort in with the director of curriculum, with the administration, and with the teachers. Sorry. Hi, thank you for allowing me to speak. Um, Lisa Kazavecchia Belliard, I'm on the committee as a community member, I'm also a mental health therapist. So I had a question um, and just a couple of comments regarding uh, the hybrid model. And I was just wondering if there's been any conversation around what that hybrid looks like. I know from the 
other committee meetings and today yeah. that it sounds like it's already been decided that it's an automatic one week on, one week off. Um, I've been reading and hearing from a lot of other folks in other districts as well as other states that there's um, a lot of what they would consider the hopscotch model of like the Monday, Wednesday, Tuesday, Friday, and then on the fifth day that any um, children with IEPs or need additional services would come on that fifth day. So, you know, from a parent's perspective, I have a going into second grade, going into fifth grade, that doing the one week on, one week off for the elementary, you know, that's a lot for her to remember from one week to doing work the next week versus if she was in school for a day, she could bring home that work, work on that the next day, be able to go into school and ask some questions, things like that. So, so you, you raise a, a real a valid point because probably of all the models, that has the most variation. So when I referenced that almost 90% of the superintendents were leaning towards a hybrid model, I, I referenced exactly what you just said though. When I, within that hybrid model is the variation and I'll just give you, I don't wanna say extremes, but I'll give you the two examples. I have health professionals saying, you know, it shouldn't be one week on and one week off, it should be two weeks on and two weeks off because of the quarantine aspect, right? Keeping those cohorts 14 days out. It's actually 16 days out if you did two weeks, it's nine days out given the weekend to your point about the gap. And then you have the cohort where you're going a day or two on Monday, Wednesday, Friday, Tuesday, Thursday, but then you're overlapping in a smaller capacity, your facilities and the numbers to do that. So there isn't, and the research is pretty clear for any educators that are here, there's not a specific hybrid model that's ideal. Mm -hmm. You're absolutely correct. I think the state's gonna struggle quite frankly, cause you're gonna have educators slash parents in different communities that are adopting different versions potentially mm -hmm. of that piece. Right um, now, is that is that possible? I mean, is that something that's going to be a conversation in our district as far as what that model will look like? Because I know that from, like I said, from the academic perspective, I, I personally feel that Monday when's, you know, doing something yeah. like that for at least my younger kids, but also from a social emotional perspective, you know, I know with the younger so kids, so the committee, to answer your question, the committee will, will make a determination on, a, on, the, on the week basis within this district. Okay. And then there'll be variations and de depending upon which so right now, the so it could be a four day week, for example, or a three day week, depending on you know, the short and shortened week. And, and if you think about some of the districts that are doing that, most of the superintendents that I've spoken to are talking about potentially having a no school on a Monday, a Friday or midweek, giving teachers an opportunity to kind of professional develop, but, but that's a, another day lost in between multiple, multiple cohorts coming back and forth as it relates. But so I'm not dismissing those other options. They all exist. We did not put a menu of cohorts together uh, and, and, and hybrid model examples mm -hmm. together as we did it. Um, we've, we've determined, in fact, the commissioner led the initial conversation about the one week on, one week off. That was, that was how it started the state. The state basically said in, 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 the, in the example of a hybrid model, it would be looked at in the, in the window of at least from a planning purpose perspective, allowing families the opportunity and calendaring out. That's what I showed you there. Right. So there, there's not, from a time frame perspective, the ability for school committee to look at multiple hybrid options, mm -hmm. considering kind of where we're at a month away from school. Okay, so that means that that decision has been made and there isn't any conversation around, you know, that being the one week, other options? The, the one week in person, one week remote is, is part of the presentation for this district, correct, for now. Okay, um, is it okay if I just speak sure. just on that, you know, as far as, um, like I, I spoke on the academic piece, but as far yep. as like the social emotional piece, I know with um, a lot, you know, I have clients that are elementary age, middle school, high school, and for some of the younger kids, especially that struggle with anxiety, you know, having a full week off, you know, and then they're needing to go back, that can really bring about a lot of that anxiety, behavior issues, things like that, where if kids are more consistently going to school, that that wouldn't necessarily be the case so much. I also saw a lot of in, in the spring, uh, middle school, high school that were, you know, staying up all night, sleeping all day because they didn't have the consistency. And so having that week off sort of allows them to be really out of schedule, out of their routine versus if they were doing a more consistent days that that, you know, I feel social emotionally would, would benefit. I, I do hear, I would, I, I would not use the term off or comparison to last spring though. I mean, we, we, right. the I expectation is those students are gonna be, right. I do hear the yeah. social aspect and they're not there. I mean, clearly that, that that's a factor. Keep in mind that 
the hybrid model is the, the difference between all of our students learning remotely, right? That's the alternative. We're, we're comparing that to at least getting some of our students in front of in, uh, in person instruction in a safe manner. And that's kind of the blended piece, but also the con of, of a hybrid model, right? There is no perfect model and or time frame. Paula, did you wanna? Uh, no. Just I just had okay, one yeah. additional piece, and then just from a working parent's perspective mm -hmm. that I know a lot of folks, um, including myself, could figure out a way to be home consistently, you know, two days a week or three days a week working from home, doing one week on, one week off. I'm not sure how working, you know, I feel like doing it, having consistent days for childcare mm -hmm. and people being able to be home, um, at least from my perspective and other parents I've talked with, mm -hmm. that they could arrange their schedules to be able to figure out childcare or being home a couple of days a week, but not one week on, one week off, so. I don't wanna, I don't wanna give you an opportunity, go ahead, Paul. So I just wanted to bring up a couple of things. Um, I am the uh, school nurse here at Aponquit High School. My name is Paula Mueller. And, yeah, and I'm a little taller than Lisa. <laughs> um, but um, I'm also the uh, kind of the leader of the health part of the task force. And um, we, we had our first meeting last Wednesday um, through Zoom. And we actually did recommend a hybrid model um, because, and, and, and I'll tell you a few things why. Um, there's been some new studies that have come out. I'm just gonna, you know, kind of push back on the stuff you cited a little bit uh, that actually says that kids age 10 to 19 may actually be more efficient at spreading COVID than adults. That is a new study that's come out recently. Um, and the other thing that I wanna push back on a little bit is that kids do not live in a vacuum. If it were just kids we were talking about, but kids go home to their families. They have parents. They have parents with underlying conditions. They have mothers with breast cancer. They have, uh, you know, grandparents that have COPD they, that they live with sometimes. They have teachers with underlying conditions. Um, and I think one of the things we thought was that the hybrid model, oh, and just as far as the one week on it and one week off, we had sort of said two weeks would be good, but then um, one of the persons on our committee is a, a doctor who's handling the return to medical school for Brown University. And when you mentioned that it's nine days, Rick, and actually the mean time for developing symptoms is about five days. So although nine days isn't a full quarantine period, it certainly gets you beyond the average time that people start to develop symptoms if they have COVID, which is, five days after their exposure. So anyway, um, the other thing about the hybrid one week on and one week off, as opposed to, and I certainly see what you're saying, Lisa, is that um, it's a little bit of a better model as far as cleaning the facilities. Because you know we know that COVID dies after a certain period of time, naturally, without even being hit with disinfectants. But I can imagine that crazy amount of cleaning that would have to take place if you have one cohort coming one day and one the next. So that would just be maybe, you know, a little bit more difficult. And then the other thing that I wanted to just mention is that the studies are also coming out now about how much this virus is aerosolized. And so that's a concern. Some of our buildings, this building, I'm not going to say it's old because it was built the same year that I was born, um, but it's getting there. <laughs> it's a very ripe piece of fruit. Um, you know, I know we're doing capital improvements on the HVAC, but the reality is, is these, some of these buildings are pretty old. Um, and, you know, I concern about, I'm, I'm concerned about packing 850 people into this building and in the winter when the windows are all shut and- Which would be the full. Would, right, would, would be that was my concern yeah. is that it seems like 400 people is better. <laughs> um, and then they have time to, you know, maybe determine if they're sick and not come to school. Yeah. So anyway, enough of me. I just wanted to bring up those points. 
Thank you, Paul. So each of the, and, and certainly if there are others, the items that have been brought up are all absolutely legit. I can't even debate or argue what you shared. It's the reality of each model having some, some areas of concern and our deficiencies and our strengths. Um, it, it's, again, I, I, maybe I didn't say it clearly, but I want to be sure. It's the beginning model that I'm suggesting, right? It's not, I'm not suggesting that's the model we adopt for 2021. In fact, even my example showed only a month period to address that, right? It was a starting point by which I think I could probably combine four of the five of the speakers tonight and say, kind of brings the best of both worlds. It also brings with it its flaws in relation, but it allows us to hopefully safely come back to school, see some students in person instruction, see how that plays out, allows us to do that, and then maybe take that next step. Um, but at the same time, take a step back. Again, I can tell you, um, I won't reference the, the superintendents, but while you were doing that, I'm on a, a string of superintendents, 11 area superintendents. <laughs> and while, they're, while a couple of the parents were speaking, they were all debating what hybrid model they were adopting, literally, as you were actually commenting. I, know I hate to look down at my phone, but area, 11 area superintendents. I'm leaning towards hybrid, remote, not sure what hybrid model makes the most sense. Community's unclear as, as, as the string of threads. So we're, not, we're, we're, we're literally all in that same situation, and we need to probably think about, and we should think about what we think is best as I think this community has really done a great job of in my time here in six years for our kids here and what's unique and what we can offer to do. Again, I'm not trying to, to sell and ultimately the school committee has, to, has a tough decision in relation in a short time frame with what's gonna be a three ring binder of information, a ton of guidance that I'm sharing with them relative to that because it does not appear the state is gonna adopt a model to start the school year. Right? I'm not putting words in the mouth, but, but to date, we have not been given any indication um, as, as what happened in the springtime when we were shut down in relation to you know, a governor decision or a commissioner decision. So a, a couple other, yes. Hi, Ashley Burgess. My uh, son is a rising second grader at Asawamsit. We're new to the district. Um, I have a question about possible parallel models um, for for families that have comorbidities or other members of the household um, that have health risks, is there a possibility if we feel like um, with our personal circumstances, there's too much danger to even have an in-person option if that is indeed what the district decides to go with? Is there an option for um, in a homeschooling oh, model? Yep. And um, if for children, like my son is, is in a sub-separate classroom with a lot of IEP services, services provided and what's the deadline in order to make that decision thank so you so two great questions and i can answer them real thank quickly you. i should have meant reference that i did in a previous piece so our sub separate programs those students in special education classes that are in high needs will go through both cohorts so in a hybrid model they will be in in school during both sessions so they will not have a one week in person one p one week off so if students run an individual iep within those sub separate programs they will come with both cohorts. Obviously, they would all be here in person mm -hmm. and remote, they would be home. Um, but to, to your point on all three models, the district slash state will provide a platform, whether it be homeschool or self-directed through, through a district slash state platform that will allow a family that for maybe medical reasons, uh, comfort levels, can't allow them to return to in-person instruction. We will have that option in place for those families regardless of the model and the deadline if for families to make that decision so once we determine what the what the model is then we'll have that time frame okay if you think of just the logistics of this if august 5th i keep putting that time frame out because that is when the next school committee meeting is it allows us about a month time frame to prepare for whatever model ultimately is adopted and will allow parents and community and we talked about transportation items and if we're dealing with transportation of students finding out which families are committed to transporting their child the first month but likewise could make a determination on whether they're prepared to accept that model for their child now knowing the facts so you'll know within a week thanks so much sure yeah hi there 
Ann Davis, I'm a fifth grade teacher at Gray's and I'm also a parent of an incoming fourth grade student at Gray's as well as, as, well as a soon to be kindergartner. Um, so I have a couple of questions where I have to put my parent hat on, but then of course I have a lot of questions where I have to put my teacher hat on. And I'm hoping for some answers. Um, you know, we keep talking about, you know, how families have the option of, you know, being able to keep their, their child home should they choose to um, because they're not comfortable with sending their child back to school. And that's all great. And I, I do feel like that speaks to the majority of the community, but I don't want us to lose focus on the minority of the community where what about the parents who don't have that option? Um, I mean, myself included, right now I'm sick to my stomach thinking about what am I gonna do with my son on that one week off while I'm expected to be in the classroom teaching that entire time. So Ian, I just wanna correct you. I don't think based on the surveys that I've seen, a majority of parents wanna have their, would choose to have their students remotely. I don't, I don't, I'm not saying choosing, but could figure it out if they need to. So is there an option for parents who don't have that choice? to send their kid full time if they need to? So th I, that was the same question. Yeah, we're gonna have to build an option and for those families if students choose not to return to school, I think it's gonna be a small percentage based on the model. No, I'm talking, about, I'm talking about children who don't have the option to stay home. Depending on what models is accepted, that would be a full in person. So would, is that a possibility for, like let's say we go hybrid and my child in particular, I don't have someone for him two days a week, no matter what I do. So the current hybrid model would allow for students to go both weeks in both in on person, if in fact they're in a sub-separate program, um, but would not be based on family. But they would, so they would have to be in a sub-separate yeah. program. Well, I, if I was that family member, I'd want to see my, I'd, I'd want to see full in person. No, and I, understand, I don't think you're understanding my question. Like, my child is not a sub-separate child. No, nope, I know, I I'm do a, understand. I'm a single mom. So, that, so that, that, that child does not have an option to stay both weeks as so part of the So what do you cohort. suggest families do in those circumstances? Is the district providing any type of child care for that and during that remote learning week? From a parent perspective, you're asking me what the parent should do in relation to, to being I responsible for their child. If I seriously don't have an option, yes. Then, then like any employee, and we're gonna be other family members, they're gonna to have to be some tough decisions as to, as to whether they are able to return to work, whether they need to take some time. Um, but that would be the case for any, in any profession. Wow. Right, okay. that would be the case. Okay. Um, yeah, and in, in, in fairness, you asked me to give you an answer. I didn't necessarily say you're gonna like my answer. I've just been, that, that's an honest answer. And that would be the case for every parent in this room. It's not just a, it's not a teacher answer. It's an answer given to, to all parents who are faced with that challenge. I have two boys myself. It's something the Madeiras household looked long and hard at in relation to that. Who are old enough to easier. stay home though, right? By themselves? No. No. Okay, a um, couple more questions. Sure. Um, so we keep talking about the kids and limiting their exposure and all that, but what about those higher risk um, teachers that are working in the building? What extra precautions are we gonna be taking for those? For so them? in addition to all the precautions to make this a safer place, individuals who fall into a category that they feel they can't return to work will have all the options available to, that any employer would offer to them, whether it be not return to work and or provide a safe environment. I'm not gonna go into all of the, the details of what's happened in each of the schools, but I'm not gonna, open a school up if I don't think it's safe for our staff to return to work. Okay. Um, you know, and the other thing too, even in the video that you showed us, it talks about, you know, having these extra precautions of wearing masks and social distancing and things like that. Now in our pre-K to grade one classrooms, I know it got brought up at the last task force meeting, those students are not required to wear masks. Now we wear masks to protect the people around us, not to protect ourselves. So you're ultimately exposing a teacher or in multiple teachers to those potential cases. So what is our plan for those pre-K to one classes? So, so pre-K to one local districts can make, require that, that students wear masks. That's a local determination. The state, I can answer what the commissioner said. So in fact, if in fact Freetown Lakeville, we feel that we're gonna require those students in those grade levels, we can do so. It's strongly encouraged and recommended in general but that can be a determination that the school committee and ultimately the administration can make. We have yet to make that determination based on that. Okay. Again, um, that video, just to clarify, 
didn't come from the superintendent of schools. It came from medical pediatrics doctors, right? Who made that determination relative to what's safe. And then one more question, because I'm not sure, like I feel like it was sort of answered, but not really. When we talk about a hybrid model as a classroom teacher, am I expected to support my 25 students remotely at the same time as support my 25 students in the building? So you're only supporting 25 students in a classroom. You don't have 25 students. You don't have 50 kids I have kids two at classes for de per yeah, day. Yeah, but different times. But yeah. yeah. So, so it's yes. a total of 25 so throughout the so school you're, So you're going to be sitting, you're going to have 10 students or 12 students sitting in front of you and then 12 that there's an expectation. So you have that same class, same number of population, just in two different venues. That's correct. Doing entirely different things though. Well, that's going to be up to us to determine what makes the most sense for those kids. Those are some of the parents' questions. What, what, is it, what the students are going to do to be engaged, and that's what the building level teams are Well, going and to I guess at. that's my question, though. We talk about the students being engaged, but how do you see that? How do you see a teacher being able to manage that? I, how do I see a teacher? I, th I see we have about 16 different models of, of, of modes of operation relative to that. Some teachers may teach. In fact, it may be a live, it may be a live film it may be they literally might be teaching and expect the students during a set time and I saw some schedules 10 o'clock is my class um, or it may be taped so that's just one mechanism to do that others may not be comfortable it's going to be our task though as a school district and to make sure that our teachers are prepared to teach to that model if that's the model that's adopted and do the best we can with our kids I'm confident that that's the case I thought in a short time with the short turnaround we did we did a uh, more than adequate job in the springtime. Oh, I agree. Um, I just don't think the community understands how much planning went into that to do it the way some teachers did it as opposed to I, others. And I haven't spent a day this summer that I didn't spend 24 seven and, and love every second thinking about how we're going to open back up. I have, <laughs> I, four, don't doubt I, have, that. I have, I have 43 days to do this right for your kids. Um, I am determined determined those of you that know me and how passionate I am how competitive I am to be sure that the model we take I see Mike nodding whatever model is adopted we will do a, an unbelievable job as it relates to meeting the needs of our kids is it going to be a challenge absolutely I said to a lot of folks our teachers worked harder and I think our teachers knocked it out of the park prior to this right I think the world of this district and I've been here six years but I can tell you that the vast majority of individuals never worked harder than the time frame when your kids were home this past spring in well, relation that, to what's expected. My... So now we're going to have, now we learned from that experience and we may now have half of our students in front of us if it's a hybrid model. Again, the determination has not been made. I'm simply indicating to you that if we're going to see kids return to school right now safely and staff return, the most logical model that should be considered that I'm leaning towards in the preliminary plan is to send half of our students back. Um, is it going to be challenging? It is absolutely going to be challenging. You will not hear me whine in relation to that piece here, in relation to that piece. What I, when I said the 24 seven piece, I just wanted you to know we're committed parents and the community to being sure whatever models adopted that we spend the time necessary and it may be five or 10 days at the start of the school year to reinforce things that our, the, the, the building teams are doing over the next couple of weeks and take advantage. That's why the commissioner just reduced the school year by 10 days. He basically said to districts, I'm willing to waive the 180 days. I want you to take advantage of additional time to prepare your schools to see our kids return to school. Now, part of that is the safety aspect and the health, but it's also the professional development to answer some of those questions in relation to providing what steps and what standards and what expectations. I spoke to a principal, she's not here today, just today about their building level team and that conversation happening. So that's gonna be an ongoing piece, Anne, and, and, and I'm confident that we'll rise to that occasion. Okay, thank you very much. Sure. Any other comments or thoughts? I just wanna make sure we have someone else as well. You come back. Hi, my name is Jeff Buck. I have an incoming kindergarten. Um, I'm curious about contact tracing and if there's any kind of policies in place around that. And if somebody in a classroom is, you know, positive, does now that class 
get, um, say, quarantined at home and so teachers, et cetera? I haven't put it on the website yet, but the task force have it. There's a detailed protocol and process in place that the state has, that, that didn't really give us option that will need to be followed in the event that there are cases, whether it be symptomatic, asymptomatic, and I see Paula um, raising her hand in response to that. So the answer is, the quick answer is yes. And there is a detailed piece that will need to be followed at every school throughout the state. But Paula, do you want to just respond? Yeah, we talked about that in our last meeting and one of the things we thought, oh, do you want me to come up there? Okay, sorry. Uh, one of the things we thought I'll teach you to raise your hand, but no, thank you. We talked about that in our last meeting. One of the things that um, the people in the subgroup thought would be really nice would be to make some sort of flow chart for parents that took that detailed guidance and made it into, you know, a little bit of a graphic form that was easier to understand and not 18 pages. Yeah. You know, yeah. like maybe we'll condense it to like one or two pages. And then if you really need the detail, you can go refer to the 18, but we'd like to Freetown Lakeville eyes it. So that flow chart, in fact, in some principles have already included. It was, it was literally, I think Paul is correct. It was an 18 page document detailed pretty cumbersome piece, but needed to have detail in relation to kind of what the expectations are. We'll, we'll synthesize that and make sure it's, a, it, it's certainly appropriate for the community to take a look at that. I'll probably put the guidance though, just for those that are interested in detail up on the website so you can see the expectations and the, and the detail behind it. I think the state, I, I, have, I, have, I have to be perfectly candid and honest from a professional and personal level. I have no criticism with the work that the commissioner has done and the governor has done in relation to the state. I, I, I don't envy their positions in relation. The state has rolled out, often people locally are critical of where the state's at as it relates to this piece. They have been providing us as much guidance as possible in detail in a timely fashion. The time is just running short in relation to the start of the school year. So when I reference something came out last night or the night before, I just received it. They're literally trying to meet the needs of all of us and allow us enough time. But I am, but I have to say, I'm, I'm impressed by the detail behind things like that to respond to that. And we'll be sure that prior to school opening up, you know, that, that you have that information readily available so you can answer that. Thanks, Paul, for helping me out too. You have a follow, did you follow up? Sure. That's okay, that's okay. Uh, others, others that didn't have a chance, sure. Hi, my name is Jeanette Remy and my daughter will be gone to the eighth grade. Um, I'm recently divorced. I'm still single handed trying to raise my daughter, even though I share custody with her father. Um, my main concern is when we did the remote learning, she struggled, she excels in the classroom. And so I just wanted to make sure she's getting the ed education she needs and also, you know, with her friends and everything, cause she needs that. I mean, I'm worried about her mental health. She's a 13 year old girl. Um, I'm in Carver, she's in a sonnet. So I'm no longer there for her 24 seven. I mean, I'm a phone call or text away. So when she was doing the remote learning, we struggled. I'm trying to help her through the phone call because unfortunately there's no co-parenting. There's no talking to the other side. So I'm still trying to do this at a distance. I just want to make sure she gets the help if she's doing remote learning, that she's getting the help if she is falling behind. What are you going to do if that happens? Is there, will those teachers help students if they're falling behind? Because like I said, she did struggle when she was doing it on the computer. Yeah, so again, that, that was the real tough situation where we had circumstances and, and clearly it, 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 you're, what you speak to is the, is the mindset that the more we can get our students in-person instruction, the better they'll, they'll be served, right? Regardless of whatever model and the hybrid's an example of that remote. We absolutely will provide that support. I can't promise you where we're gonna end up relative to the data and what model we'll end up in based on what happens in six weeks from now. Uh, but clearly we will provide whatever supports necessary. I, you know, my, my, certainly my intent is to try to see us get as many kids and staff back in person instruction as possible. I just don't know if it's realistic for us to start the year in, in full. Okay. In Cause I was also instruction. concerned with the transportation. Like, um, like I said, it's quite a distance. I'm in Carver. Like, I don't know if her father would be able to get her to school, especially in my distance. So I, I mean, the bus is also like a big thing that we would need. So it's yeah. definitely a concern. Um, so, I mean, when she was at the intermediate school, Principal Sullivan watched me carry my daughter basically for five months when she broke her leg, was in a cast up to her hip for five months. So like, you know, so it's tough being the distance now, you know, having the custody share. And so I just want to make sure my daughter's going to get the education, you know, the ride to school that she needs. 
and also she does have health concerns. She does have asthma, so she does struggle with the mask. So she can wear it for like a couple minutes, but then she's gasping for it, so she has to pull it down. So I didn't know what else. I'm sure there's going to be more students that they're going to have to be accommodated because of the, the you know, of their health. Yep. And again, from an advisory or communication piece, we not to go into detail, we're going to have to build in some mass breaks and opportunities for kids, just for example, there. Okay. And that's already been discussed at the building level, regardless of the grade. Regardless of the model, we're going to provide transportation for kids, um, All right. whatever, whatever is determined, obviously. Um, and once that model is in place, like I said, we already have bus routes in place for all of our kids for full instruction, but also for the hybrid piece. All right. Thanks. Like, like I said, education, I mean, most of all of us, we all worry about education. You know, most of us work and most of us are separated. So we do have this struggle with the parenting, the education, the transportation. And that's, you know, my daughter's education is 100% my concern because she's also got goals now trying to get into Old Colony and we are at the stage now. For those parents, if I didn't make it clear, if I could bring all our kids back and staff back in person, they'd be coming back. We wouldn't have this issue relative to daycare and childcare. I want them, our staff want these kids to return. The question is what is the right model to do it safely to start the year in? Um, as I started off the night, if you think about it, an hour and a half or so ago, a little bit longer than that now, I basically said the issue is not open in school right, that from the former CDC director, it's keeping it open and doing it safely. I think we have a lot of data to support um, some sort of on-site instruction. Um, and unless the state tells us differently or the school board feels strongly that, that we can't do that in the model based on what they're hearing, and it's important that people do communicate so they can make an informed decision. I don't, the survey that I saw does not show me that the vast majority in, in, of the community in Freetown and Lakeville want to see their kids in full remote learning. It, the numbers just don't show that. So we have to be sure that we can provide a model as best we can that's safe for our kids and try to get some in-person instruction. And that's kind of the intent behind where I think we're heading. That can change. I would have said to, I would have said to so those of you that know me pretty well, six weeks ago, I was full court, right? Mike's already laughing. I was full press that we're bringing all our kids back. Full press. 2,800 students, we are gonna make this work. We actually have the spacing, three feet, right? We do, our full person, in-person model. But there are certainly a lot of other factors that contribute to us maybe not starting out in that model that uh, don't make it necessarily maybe the safest model that to, to start the year and at all levels. And I think I'm speaking for a lot of other districts that are also wrestling with that right now. Other comments or questions before we wrap up? Sure. Yeah, so the question is before and after care, and we are considering doing that on site at the school. So if we have in person, so instead where we've done in the past where we transported them, would we keep them on site. So Lisa Pacheco, the director, will take a look at what's the safest way to have that type of care for those students. It has to be on site, obviously. For those students, if it's in the hybrid model that are there that week, whether it be the A or, or B, or if all the students back. But we're, the plan right now initially is not to transport them to another, to another school, but to have the program there, which requires a little more staffing and more funding, but it's the safest approach. But we are considering that as a component to, to, uh, to whatever model we adopt. Great question. A couple other, I just wanna make sure I catch everybody. Mary Beth, you Hi, my name is Mary Beth Moore. Um, I'm a mom of two kids. One is in sub-separate program and the other is a, attends a, a Poniquit. I have three major points I just wanted to ask questions about. Sure. So uh, last night after viewing the state guidelines that you shared, one of my major concerns, I guess, would be with the hybrid or remote learning for any of the um, testing. How, do they, um, how are they gonna validate testing? So if, if say in hybrid, someone's home for a week yep. and they have a test while they're at school, the other students are in school and then, oh, there's a test with the, I mean, I'm, I can't imagine teachers coming up with two complete tests. I mean, that would be ridiculous. We're gonna have to absolutely have an assessment model in place to address that though. That's not even talking about state modeling. You're talking about just assessment in general and grading and performance. Yes. Absolutely a component. If you look at the remote learning guidance, which in, in theory addresses two models, right? It addresses full remote 
but also the hybrid because half your kids aren't there. And it's very specific and clear that the expectation is that a grading mechanism and assessment must be in place to meet the needs of all the kids. Yep. And as far as like the state guidelines, they mentioned cohorts over and over, make sure there's cohort groups. Mm -hmm. When you get to the middle school and the high school, you have uh, students who are at all different levels of learning. So I, I can't mm -hmm. visualize what kind of model that would be or how the students would so stay So at the in secondary that level, it becomes absolutely more challenging, right? At, and, and you're absolutely right. The elementary level, you're able to cohort those grade level students. You're able to move teachers, for example, at teams at the middle school and not have the kids cross over but those ability groups might be in place and we have electives in high school. You're trying to minimize though, and you're trying to place them in wings so they're not traveling as many locations. That I, literally, and I, and, I, and I know you don't have the luxury that I have as superintendent, but Mike can speak to this. The principals are submitting 18 and 20 page documents on the detail behind how that type of question is addressed with schedules and detail, which will be part of our August 10th submission. So once a model is determined, you'll start to see. We didn't, we didn't flood you with all that information, but understand that the educators and administrators behind that are looking at, okay, so what can we do to minimize or marginalize the, the risk relative to cohorts? It's a little easier at the elementary school, Mary Beth. You're absolutely oh, yeah. correct in comparison, but they're being taken into account. I can tell you that they're, they're looking at block scheduling, for example, at the high school. So instead of eight periods, you have four periods, longer periods of time. Just okay. that, that type of example. Great okay. question. All right, my second major sure. point is for the sub-separate program, mm -hmm. um, which my son is in and many of my friends' children are in and my friends are a lot of the staff members that take care of these children. Um, it's, and again, in the state guidelines, uh, the staff members and some of the students, depending on their disability and health concerns, um, the staff is asked to, to wear like the maximum amount of PPE. Um, my concern for those people is if you're wearing like I can barely do a mask for two hours, right? And then we're all ready to get fresh air. So these people who are gonna be maybe in a gown or a face mask or even a shield or something, some of these rooms, as you know, we don't have air conditioning in them and they get pretty darn hot. So I'm wondering what's gonna be done as far as like cooling ventilation for these sub-separate rooms? Yeah, so we, are, we, have, we actually do have some cooling systems and they're being upgraded in some of the, some of the main campuses, as you know, the middle school and intermediate school and high school. Um, but we're going to have to make those adjustments and, and breaks because we absolutely did order PPE, for example, and we did have different masks and shields in relation to some of our paraprofessionals and, and, and professional and adults that are going to be working closer with those kids. It has to be built in as part of the day. For anybody who's experienced that, myself included, it, it's, it's challenging for an hour and a half or two hours. But I will say there can't be an alternative. The option of not wearing a mask is too great a risk. Right. I think we all have seen that and I think we've benefited from that. We need to be sure that we're, we're adhering to those steps. Um, but, but Mary Beth, you make great points and they're all gonna have to be taken into account to, uh, in this new era that we face relative to those kids. But those kids will, would, in a hybrid model, would be here in-person in instruction on both weeks. Right, exactly. Yep, and thanks. my last point, um, sure. I'm also a substitute teacher for the district. Um, so my question is, um, is there going to be some kind of training or something for our substitute teachers? And how are you going to have enough to cover in this circumstance yep. where we really don't have enough coverage when, you know, in a typical school year? So, so. We, we typically struggle with a cadre of substitute teachers on a normal basis. Um, but I will say through the survey, which was really task force members, we get quite a few uh, individual community members who expressed interest in volunteering. Now, I don't know if I take them up on that and I'll be following up. I have all those contacts but it does involve some additional orientation and training. We may have to use some of that additional time that's built in before the start of the school year and then maybe one more session in the fall related to those individuals who are coming in as maybe a substitute yeah. um, and or volunteer because they're obviously going to play a critical role even more so. Right, especially with the quarries and fingerprinting, yeah. it does take quite a while yeah. to process that. So I'm, we're gonna I know We're going to have to count on our two town communities, though, because let's be honest, every school district is going to be in that same situation looking for substitutes. Right, yep. So if we can't, if we can't rely on individuals within our own communities, I think it's going to be a real struggle. That's an honest answer. Okay, thank you very much. Sure. Other comments or thoughts? So for those of you, I see Derek there before. Rep. So if you thought... July 27th was gonna wrap this all up and you were gonna feel, I've got it, we're good to go. Not happening. It is unbelievably frustrating from my perspective, from a personal and professional level. 
For any of you that are A-types, right, that like to be organized and scheduled and detailed, and my administrators are like that, you have everything in place. You've got, you know, I like the bus list that I shared with you earlier. I like everything. There's nothing neat, neat about this summer. We're changing. I sent an email, and Mike can attest this to my school, to my leadership team today. And I said, the word of the summer is flexibility. Both principals remembered. Flexibility. Because I had to change a meeting around for them, and I wish I had a better answer for you. Families, it's being flexible. It is. It's not an easy answer, and it's going to be more challenging for some than others. I really do have a, a, a angst for those parents that have younger children. Not that it's an easy task for high school, middle school, because I reference my two boys. I'll take you up on that. I agree. College age, they better be self-directed and be ready to roll. Those of you that have 21, 19 year olds know that that's not the case, a little sarcasm there, right? But I, I'm believing that that's the case. But that five-year-old, we have parents here starting out, it's their first experience. But I can't fix that. I can't fix that. I'm gonna ask you to be supportive, flexible, invest like you've done since I've been here, and in, in, in really embrace whatever model we have and do the best you can. It is not, Sherry Barron has not spoken tonight, and I'm not gonna put her on the spot. She is today representing the eight school committee members. Think of that task. Vote a model next week based on the information you have, the 400 pages of guidance that the state has shared, and all of that that makes sense, and then let's roll up our sleeves and go to work. That's their task. The state didn't give them an option to say bail out, uh, in relation to meeting the needs of kids. And, I, and I'm convinced this committee uh, is all about kids. It really is. These individuals will do and make the decision that's best for their children. They're gonna ask me for a recommendation. I'm already hinting at kind of where I'm at right now um, in relation to that. And then we roll up our sleeves and get to work and we're already at work. Again, I, you know, if that's not the answer, it's not a Newt Rockney speech, I'm sorry, but it's, from my perspective, I am as enthusiastic and as passionate about seeing this done right for our kids. We owe it to those kids. We owe it to all of our kids. We owe it to all of our employees to be sure that we have them return to school in person in a safe environment. And if we can't do that, then you just answered what we should do to start the school year. Right? As a collective school community, if we can't do that, then you have a model that does that. And then you focus on that model, right? I think, I think for my, my building principles, I'm not putting them on the spot. Three models is challenging because they're trying to do the best looking at three different pieces. I think we're gonna then be able to prioritize and say, okay, so that's the model, we've accepted that, and there'll be a little, you know, I want the sleeves and all, I would have done this, I think we could have done that, but then we'll move forward and we'll do that collectively and we're gonna need that from both Freetown and Lakeville and the community. Derek, did you wanna jump in? To the show? Yeah. Uh, and anyone else, really, I'm, we'll, we'll Just stay a here. quick point, sure. I'm sorry to belay the, this meeting. Um, I think one of the things that we're running up against here is time, obviously. Okay. And the only point I wanna make is there's a lot of questions, more questions than answers at this point that I see. There needs to be some clear communication when decisions are made that go out to the folks, the parents of expectate, I mean, all the items that we talked about tonight, expectations, grading, what it's gonna look like logistically. Okay. Uh, so, you know, point, I, I don't know what you're gonna, how that time is gonna work. It's gonna run right up against it seems school and there's a lot that parents are gonna digest in that in a short time before kids go back with whatever model we go back through. So, so keep in mind, we started this task force three weeks before the state said it would be a good idea to come up with a district task force. I know it doesn't seem like that. Kenny Rosendi was just talking transportation, he deals with multiple districts and said, I think you guys are ahead. So think about the districts that didn't jump, get an early jump on this to Derek's point. And I know sometimes you walk out of here saying, what did we do? We didn't take the vote of formal action. You're communicating an awareness and an advice to be sure that the questions you're asking when the model is adopted are answered, are answered in detail 
so you can confidently send your child to school or engage them at home and feel that we've done everything that's possible to start the school year in that instance. And it's gonna involve a change in a, in a calendar and how many days do we spend? I'm a little concerned and I shared this with Renee, for example, that we front load all 10 of those days and push back the start of school and then don't have any additional time. I would prefer to use five days in a week and then build in some time those first few weeks to answer some things that we found we could do better or need to focus on and kind of break it up that way. Um, because that gives us a little bit more flexibility. Um, but in each instance, in each model, you can, put, you can list the pros and cons as it relates to what's happening. We're submitting three models. The state is, is requiring us to submit three models. We are able to meet all three models here in Freetown Lakeville. It's just various levels as to what we can do relative to social distancing, spacing, and it, there's no perfect model, one size fits all. I know some people are hoping the state comes out and makes that determination. Think about that on the magnitude of the Commonwealth. I'm not so sure that's fair. Do we want the decision for Freetown Lakeville to be what's best for Boston or Springfield? You know, or the, the multiple districts and communities? No, I think I'd wanna keep that control and ownership and feel that we at a part in that process. You can email me, text me. I'm gonna share the survey. Um, we have a school committee meeting next week. We do have one this week, but the sole purpose is doing some interviews for a position, so there won't be a conversation on that. Um, this has been streamed. I really do appreciate Lake Cam communicating out there because I do know there are multiple people who couldn't make tonight's meeting. I'm gonna provide some more detail on some of the guidance, which will answer some of your questions today. Some of you asked about protocols, tracing and some things that are in that are involved in documents that my administrators are already working on with educators to be sure that we have in place to address your needs so again take a look at those uh call me my office is open every day we're here been here throughout this whole process we didn't shut down i thought it was important to provide some accessibility um and and we still have some work ahead of us before the start i did see a hand sure Sure. So they don't really have much alternative in relation to what the state has said. The state said that your final plan must be submitted August 10th and there, sh there must be vote taken prior to that. So in fairness to the committee, and I don't wanna put Sherry in the spot, their only scheduled meeting other than the, the director of finance position meeting is August 5th. They could in fact schedule another meeting, but they, have not, they don't have a plan right now to do so. Again, that's not a time frame that's ideal for them. Just so folks, I think everybody kind of realizes that now, but the state is requiring that formal action be taken as, as it relates to that prior to your final submission. The three ring binder is like this large relative to what I'm submitting to the state. And I've got to get a document that's parent and family friendly. That means something to you as a parent, right? So you can address those areas and that, that model that makes sense. But we're supplying all the backup, the diagrams and everything else that went into decision making at this level. And that's coming from the schools. Does that answer your question relative to that? So in all likelihood, a determination will be made based on the preliminary plan that will be submitted this Friday, which is an online document, four or five pages. Just, I mean, don't, it's not a real complex thing. First, they wanted to determine whether schools had the space. And we immediately checked off that box after our feasibility study to determine we do have space to accommodate our students. A lot of school districts do not. Any final questions? I'm not going anywhere. So if you wanna come up and see me individually, if you didn't wanna jump in front of the microphone, I appreciate the passion. In fact, I'd be disappointed if you weren't passionate. I can't imagine a, a, another topic that, that would share that same passion, right? Our children, our kids, we, we all have that same angst. And, and so in some instances, people were, were emotional about it and upset. I'm okay with that. I am okay with that. My responsibility as superintendent of schools for you folks is to be sure that when I make a decision or a recommendation, I do what I think based on the facts is in the best interest of all kids and staff. 
And that's what I intend to do in this decision. That's what the school committee intends to do. And any information you can provide and help in that, in that piece or be part of the process like you did tonight and have given up a couple hours of your time to do so, please, we have a couple of weeks to kind of make that determination. We have this week and next week, and then we kind of move forward. And then we have four weeks or five weeks to prepare for that determination, which is a lot of time with some of the talented folks we have. We have phenomenal teachers and educators in this district. We really do. And I'd like to see your kids in front of them in person. <laughs> I think most of you would as well, if not all of you. We just need to be sure that September 2020, whatever the date is we decide to roll back here, that that makes the most sense. It's not about opening the schools, as I said and started this night. It's about how do we maintain and keep them safe and keep them open. Thanks, folks, for your night. Again, I'm available if you need to see me. Appreciate it. Thank you.